Um, oh, great. Um, by the way, Defon set up um, the recordings can be found, as you know, in pages, in B course pages, but he's also set up a, uh, a YouTube site that will keep all of the recorded lectures there. I wanted that because other people ask me if they can see some of our lectures. So this would be an easy way to do it without going through um, uh, the Cal B courses. So it's there if anyone wants it. And presumably he's got an announcement out. Anyway, uh, what this says is the feedback that I've gotten from some of you um, suggests that you would like to put more emphasis on the projects and reduce emphasis on the homeworks. And there's a couple of ways I think we can do that. Um, but uh, what I'm addressing here right now, well, so we'll figure out a way to reduce the emphasis on the homeworks. Uh, we already said that you would have two buys um, I'll see if that's the right number. And also, it's just a matter of how many homeworks do we do and how many chapters do we do and when do we do them. I'm um, thinking that I'll have less homeworks near the end of the term when, um, when you're trying to focus on getting these projects done. Okay, so the, my idea for the projects would be, <clears throat> you choose a topic, I'll mention later, but you check it with me first, that it's appropriate for our class, either, it, um, expands on something that we've spoken about or it brings in um, uh, new thoughts maybe completely wasn't in our class you'll see an example or two of that and you could work you could each do your own individual project okay or you could work in a small group two or three people and within that group you could either in the end submit a combined report uh, and and do um, a choreographed presentation at the end, or you could simply do individual reports that are related, but but make make them um, a coordinated presentations. Okay, so here's some examples, and we'll go through them, and then I'll come back because there are some names associated with some of them. Um, and again, uh, these are suggestions. So if you have another idea, um, send me an email. Okay, and if you want to work with somebody in a group, let me know about that too. So X-ray CT imaging. So we already spoke about this uh, while we were waiting. Um, Angel Rodriguez and Alex Ho both said they're interested in CT imaging. So there's an opportunity. Um, one might be um, micron scale uh, without optics, maybe not micron, but uh, fewer tens of microns, but without optics. So this, there's great op opportunities there and people do it. Or you could do nanoscale with, for instance, zone plate optics, and people do that too. CT scans of uh, individual uh, biological cells. And then there's coherent diffractive imaging, which is no optics, but high degree of coherence. So, um, so that's some thoughts. Um, so resolutions would get mixed into that and applications. Another one was x-ray scattering. Several of you mentioned um, small angle x-ray scattering and other kinds of scattering or, or metrologies. And wh what are the, what's the science? Are there any industrial applications? Uh, what spatial scales do you examine when you do that? And uh, what angular resolution is involved? And in some cases, it might involve spatial coherence. So this is, this is one where spatial coherence could play a role, um, it's worth looking into. Uh, another one is gas liquid interfaces. So several people are interested in the topic of gas liquid interfaces. So explain to us what's the techniques, what's the science drivers, and um, how do you do it, what do you learn? Uh, another one is x-rays and electrons. What are the complementary advantages? Uh, so TEM, SEM, cryo, what are the relative resolutions? What are the damage issues? And what kind of science are people doing with these things today? And perhaps what you would like to do. So Hannah, this has your name written all over it, but you are welcome to choose something else. Uh, related to that is radiation dose. You know, so someone might describe what's the mechanisms for radiation dose? What is dose? What's lethality? Uh, how does it apply to soft materials versus harder materials, or etc.? And so, for example, 
Now, Xiao Zhao expressed an interest in radiation damage. So you could make a project out of this. You could coordinate with HANA if you wanted, or you could just do it separately. Um, undulator, so I'm just going in order, roughly the order that we're coming to in the book. So undulator radiation, but we'll, we will talk about undulator radiation in class a lot, but what we won't talk a lot about, although we could mention it, is the issues of polarization of the undulator radiation. How does that relate to spin and magnetic materials <coughs> or to helicity like in DNA, uh, so helical structures. So there could be someone who could pick up on that. And who was it? Oh yeah, Xiaoxi Huang said that he's interested in, in these uh, spin and spin systems. So then there are some things here for the uh, for people from the chemistry department or anyone else who wants to, but a couple of high harmonic generation issues. What's the science? Uh, I can't see this myself. Uh, some examples, uh, which we won't, we won't say much in class, but electron dynamics of molecules uh, and semiconductors at interfaces. So here interfaces comes up again. Um, another would be, um, Nonlinearity um, examples. Uh, first of all, you can focus high harm. You can focus the radiation down to very high intensities. It's not really wh where you want to go for most high harmonic generation. But um, how could it be used at interfaces to to produce uh, second harmonic generation? So some EUV going in from a free electron laser or from a uh, high harmonic. And um, how can that be used for probing the interfaces? And so important issues here uh, are intensity and coherence. And I've been a reader on several thesis or qual exams recently. And uh, in some cases, the issues were understood properly in terms of intensity and coherence. In some cases, they were not. So this is, um, I want to bring this up a little bit in class because this is an area where the the coherence will matter, and also where intensity matters more than everyone's recognizing. Another thing would be to compare um, high harmonics and uh, free electron lasers, high harmonic free electron, uh, uh, sorry, X-ray free electron lasers. And with regard to femtosecond duration and attosecond duration pulses, what photon energies goes with those short pulses? What are the, rel what are the relative advantages? What kind of science could you do? Uh, and what about closing the gap? The, the FEL people are trying really hard to get below a femtosecond. In fact, they managed to get below somewhat, a fraction of a femtosecond, but where's that going? So that's what I meant by closing the gap. So there are three different topics here that I'm suggesting, but you can think of others and you can coordinate amongst yourselves, um, the four people in the chemistry department, for instance, for sure, but others may, may just be interested in that. Uh, then there are laser produced plasmas. So this could be just some meat and potatoes laser produced plasma, uh, plasma issues, but it has to be a hot dense plasma to produce enough photons that we see it. It could be something in astrophysics, which I didn't say here, but nonlinear effects um, are quite common here. And they're normally written in terms of the oscillating velocity, the so-called quiver velocity of the electrons in a focused electron beam. That's Vos and V thermal, the VTH is the thermal velocity. And that's a parameter. This is a parameter for nonlinear effects in plasmas. When this is much less than one, not too much nonlinearity, but when this gets to a, be around one or greater than one, then you have really strong um, nonlinear effects. So stimulated Brillouin, stimulated Raman scattering, et cetera. Uh, there's also expansion velocity. So we'll, we will cover that briefly, but how is that expansion velocity relevant to different uh, applications? But in particular, EUV lithography, it has a really important role. And uh, one of the things that's going on there is in lithography, what's the size of the plasma D and what's the wavelength that's being used to irradiate it's uh, now CO2 at 10.6 microns. And these diameter of the little pellets they use are only like 25 microns. So this is pretty close to this. 
because of this, you need a plasma expansion. So if someone's interested in EUV lithography or the plasma physics of the expansion, then there are two, two papers, um, two topics here related to Bella, which is a Wakefield accelerator up at the lab, but a few of the people in the class are working on that. So maybe they wanna combine to do something. Maybe somebody else wants to get interested, but it's laser driven accelerators. Here the nonlinear index, is very strong. If you look at this parameter here, this is going to be greater than one. This is not just quivering to produce some harmonics or uh, frequency shifting or stuff like that. It's actually pushing the plasma out of the way. So that could be interesting to have it described to us. And what are the properties uh, of this? What kind of photon energy, what kind of electron energies do you accelerate? What kind of photon energies do you see? What's the flux, the phase space? How stable is this? And then, um, where am I? Oh, Jason, Jason Parker suggested he's interested in X-ray velocimetry, velocimetry. And uh, so a lot of people do visible uh, methods here. So what, what it is, it's a flash you produce a flash, a pulse, and you do it twice or multiple times, and you see the object moving. And he's looking for things that are um, really opaque and visible. But anyway, so what are the applications? Is it in science or industry or whatever? So it's a possibility too. And then there's just one, I put one for EUV lithography, just throwing out an idea, but how does this relate to Moore's law? What are the so-called nodes? What's logic and memory chips? What kind of sources of radiation are needed for this? What's used now, but what might be used next? For instance, there's a EUV FEL um, being built. What role might it have? And what's the limits on this EUV lithography? So I'm suggesting that we get an early start by you speaking, thinking about what project you would like to do if you want to coordinate it with others or combine with others. So check the potential projects with me after you think it over a while. Uh, identify some relevant papers that you could use to report on this. And perhaps we can arrange for a contact for further suggestions or references. So in previous years, some of the students just knew what to do or they went in the library and or did Google searches and found the papers that they wanted. But in some case, we actually made contact with someone who was a leader in the field. Uh, and by email, that's so easy wherever they are. So, could we have some feedback now? Not, I don't mean feedback on your spe specific topic you want. Give that some thought. Um, but if we're going to put some more emphasis on this and less on hom uh, homeworks, then you need to get started. You, you will need to get started soon. And certainly you don't want to leave it for the last week or two of the semester, you know, when you have a crush from all kinds of other courses. So, um, um, Professor? Yeah. Um, is there like a past recording or like the example of the presentations for the project? Like, are there any requirements in terms of the length of it? Can yes, I, I put, yeah, this is a really good question. I put some of that in one of the posted announcements for, on B courses, but uh, just to say it, uh, what we did last year, we may want to iterate this a little bit, but last year and the, and the previous few years, in fact, going back a decade probably, um, the idea was you had a write-up, a written write-up of three to five pages with five figures, okay? One of which was just an introductory figure. And then when you did the oral presentation, you used those same figures and made them into slides and, um, and you gave a talk. And so last year, there were 12 minute talks with three minutes questions. So 12 minutes with five slides, one being the introduction and one a conclusion. Uh, so it's pretty compact. Um, maybe we should rethink that. We're, we're certainly not talking about 20 page reports, but um, I'll give you a sense of what we did. And people did things which weren't projects which weren't exactly their PhD thesis, but something related was fine. And maybe giving it a broader view. 
something relevant to the class, something that would interest the other people in the class. Is that okay? Um, yes, and then another question is, uh, when do we have to let you know our topic by? I didn't set a date, but I would suggest that you, if we're gonna put some more emphasis on this, I would say in a week or two, you should figure this out. So you can get an early start and not feel pressured, you know, incredible time pressure at the end of the semester. So it's not too long. The written part is not too long. The slides, not that many. Um, but I do want you to do a thoughtful job of it. And I do want you to answer the homeworks, but I will see if there are ways in which we could um, reduce that. Thank you. Is this more of a research project or like, I guess, um, like reading papers and gathering information versus actually conducting an experiment? Yes, absolutely. Right. No, okay. not, this is not requiring, this is a library search, which, you know, again, may relate to your thesis. So you already know a lot about it, but, um, but the, you know, half of it, you may not know. Yeah. Okay. And if it makes sense to combine with somebody else in the class <coughs> for some related material, that's okay too. Okay. So I would say the best thing to do is give it a little bit of thought and start sending me email messages and we'll get a dialogue going on how to proceed. Okay, okay great. Well, thanks for the questions. So, oh. I think this is the last slide, which we may have shown, but didn't get into. But so we talked about the electromagnetics of the X-ray region so far, you know, scattering, refractive index, the coherence issues. Um, again, because of a good question, I think, who was it from? I think it was from Angel last time. Coherence will matter a lot to some of these topics and some of the people in the class. Coherence will not matter a lot to others. So for instance, CT scanning with hard x-rays where there's no optics involved and it's just shadow casting, coherence doesn't play a role. Okay, But there are some sources where it does play a role. So we're going to go through sources. So we're going to start with undulator radiation. <coughs> it's a version of synchrotron radiation with permanent magnets, but they're periodic permanent magnets with a periodicity lambda u. And the electrons are highly relativistic. And we're going to find that we can get all of the interesting properties that we want out of this without going into relativistic, um, with, without going significantly into uh, relativity and electromagnetics with relativity. We're going to find cute ways to get everything we want, in a relatively simple manner. But anyway, we, so we're going to do that. It turns out that um, if you make these undulators extremely long, there's a feedback mechanism starts to occur. And what was initially a bunch of electrons coming in here, which were randomly located, the, all the electrons moving around uncoordinated, uncorrelated and radiating. And so their radiation, each electron was basically in an undulator, basically radiates into it all by itself. As it goes through the periodic structure, it oscillates, it radiates, but because it's uncorrelated, in motion with the others, the intensities, the electric fields don't add up. They average out to zero, um, the correlation does. So you wind up just adding intensities here. But if you make this long enough, going from a few meters for an undulator at the ALS or one of the other synchrotrons to hundreds of meters, maybe even a half a kilometer, if you do that, there is a feedback mechanism that comes in and that's what's over here, and it's called the free electron laser. And as you make the length of the undulator longer, the bunch of randomly uh, positioned electrons with their motions starts to form a modulation. Basically, an electron wave appears in. So this consider this to be like a water wave, okay? These are oscill not oscillations. These are uh, a periodic modulation of the beam. And in this case, the motion of the particles is coordinated and the electric fields do add. It's different than the simple undulator down here. 
and you get a lot more power. So rather than getting a few watts as you did here, you get gigawatts. And also these pulses are relatively short, a few femtoseconds, maybe 20, 30 femtoseconds, but uh, um, okay. So we'll talk about both of those. What's the physics? We'll do some algebra, we'll show the equations and we'll solve them. And then there'll be applications. And depending on their level of interest, you can take um, just a knowledge of basically of how it works uh, and be educated on it, um, or you can really get into it. That'll be your choice. So the next chapter after these two is on high harmonic generation, which I call laser high harmonic generation, just so people know better. But basically you have something <coughs> like a Thai sapphire laser, which produces very short pulses, so many femtoseconds in duration, you focus it down, you focus that light down onto a spot size where there are inert atoms, maybe in a gas collection, maybe in a gas jet, but things like helium, neon, argon, Krypton, and the intensity of this is high enough. It's not too high. You have to be very, it's, it's a balance here, but basically, if you get the right intensity, something like a few times 10 to the 14th watts per centimeter squared, uh, the, the electric fields are strong enough to pull electrons off the atoms, off each of these atoms, and not only pull them off, but once they're liberated, so called born born free, uh, then they're in this intense laser field, electric field, and they oscillate with the laser frequency. So they've been pulled off and they start oscillating. Whenever they oscillate, they radiate. And <clears throat> we'll go through why in class, but they basically add up in phase, making very strong pulses in the forward direction. And if there's a periodicity to the laser, what happens is harmonics, the radiation can come out as a series of harmonics, like a comb of different frequencies, um, uh, odd, odd harmonics of the fundamental driving it. And this gets you to very strong pulses in the extreme ultraviolet, photon energies of say 30 EV to 50 or 80 EV, a little bit higher, but with less, less of them. Uh, but anyway, in this extreme ultraviolet, you can get you can get intense pulses, a lot of photons, and um, very short pulses. And so this is a way to get femtosecond pulses or even attosecond pulses. So the shortest pulses we know in any of these things are done with high harmonics and the numbers, the shortest pulses recorded and, and used in science are under 100 attoseconds. 80 attoseconds is one that comes to mind because some of the Berkeley students several years ago did PhD thesis, or at least wrote up their thesis in the end uh, on this issue of producing 80, 80 attosecond students. So one, 80 attosecond pulses in the EUV. One, one was an AS and T student who made the mirrors, which allowed it uh, played an important role, and one was from chemistry, uh, one of Steve Leone's students who. Um, had the first paper on using 80 attosecond pulses. So we'll talk about that at length. So we'll have a couple of lectures on those three topics. Uh, we'll have some discussion about hot dense plasmas. Uh, I want to talk to the people who are interested in hot dense plasmas. There are four, two from Bella and two others. And I want to talk to you about how we'll cover that. And EUV atomic lasers. <coughs> so nobody's interested in this. And it hasn't turned out to be such a hot topic anymore. It looked really exciting for a while, but, um, and it, does, it certainly works. But um, I think what we might, we might have a lecture or two on it, mainly so that you understand how a laser works, period. Never mind an EUV laser, just so I'll show some slides on that. And when we're getting closer to it, I'll ask who's interested, I'll show you something, okay? Does anyone wanna comment before I jump to another slide? So we will have sort of two lectures, I'm guessing, maybe three on each of these topics, okay? And it depends on how many questions you ask, how much time it takes. And I would much rather that you ask questions and we had less lectures. So I am slowly learning uh, that less can be more. So uh, please ask questions. Oops, oh yeah, these are the things. So 
this is going to be, this is a way that one can see with an undulator, how is it you produce such short wavelengths? Let me see if there's a diagram in the next, yeah. Let me start here. Electrons go through at almost the speed of light, one part in 10 to the eighth or one part in 10 to the ninth, less than the speed of light. So the ALS up on the hill or all of the synchrotron facilities, these electrons in a beam, so not one electron, it's a bunch of electrons, maybe 10 to the eighth or 10 to the ninth electrons per bunch. And then there's another bunch a few nanoseconds later and another bunch after that. And so they're coming around. So there is some time structure, but most people don't use it. The magnet structure is a periodic magnet with a so it's north pole, south pole, north pole, so that the the uh, there's a vertical magnetic field, there's an axial velocity, Lorentz force v cross b. Here's the v, here's the b, produces an oscillation in and out with the same periodicity, and the periodicity we write as lambda u on the undulated period, and it's a few centimeters, three or four centimeters is quite typical. Okay. And the, um, however, the radiation that comes out on axis, the shortest wavelength on axis, turns out to be lambda u, this three centimeters, let's say, divided by two gamma squared, where gamma is the um, one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared, the relativistic Lorentz factor, which you probably all learned about in high school. But why does this turn out to, why do you get this gamma squared? Why do you go from centimeters to x-rays in the nanometer region, maybe even the angstrom region? So we're going to find a really simple way to do this. Um, Dave Jackson, who recently passed away, but probably a lot of you read his book. Um, he liked this so much when he heard about it from me that he wrote an article for Physics Today. So I thought it was a sort of a neat way to avoid a lot of complications about relativistic electrodynamics, but he also liked it. And the radiation comes out, we'll find, in a very small angle, a one over gamma square root of n, where n is the number of periods, and these will be in microradians. So we have radiation that's gonna seem to come from an electron bunch, which is of order 100 microns in diameter or less in one direction, sometimes they're elliptical, and uh, half angles, <coughs> excuse me, of micro radians. This is, this is, it really has very good coherence properties. It's not perfect, it's not a laser, but you get really good. And in fact, the way, the funding for the ALS was based on the fact that this was a completely new idea at the time, that you could have a bunch of random electrons coming through and somehow or other you managed to get spatially coherent x-rays. It was a surprise. Um, but it was important. Okay. So we'll talk about that. Oh, and how can one see the short wavelength just visibly? Here's an oscillating electron going in and out of the board, and it's radiating spherical waves. It's not moving, or it's moving very slowly. Okay. And so it's oscillating in and out of the board at some frequency, and it radiates at that frequency. If you happen to be viewing it over here, it's coming towards you, and it's moving, but moving with a very slow velocity. There's a Doppler shift, so we all know that, again, from high school. But what happens if this same electron that's oscillating up and down is moving not at a very slow velocity, but almost the velocity of light? Then, uh, so V approximately equal to C, but a little bit less, then all of these spherical wave fronts are radiating away, but the electron keeps generating more and more, and it's going at almost the same speed. Remember, one part in 10 to the eighth or one part in 10 to the ninth less than the speed of light. So basically, the electrons are moving at C, for instance, at the ALS. And as a result, there's a bunching of these wavelengths. And we'll go through a little, really, algebra, and we'll use a Doppler, the Doppler formula. This is the classical Doppler formula where V over C is much less than one. But when, when the electrons are relativistic, it gets modified by this Lorentz factor gamma, which we talked about a moment ago. And so the formula looks the same, but the gamma comes in. And we'll find, we will, we will be able to get that fact that that lambda is of order lambda over, over two gamma squared. This is not showing everything. So we'll do that. And this uh, picture, by the way, comes from uh, John Mady uh, from Stanford. He was, 
He was the graduate student who published the first article on a, and, and coined the phrase free electron laser. He was a second year graduate student when he published it and it was not part of his thesis. He's the only author. His advisor told him, no, you publish it by yourself or you did it yourself. So an interesting historical thing. Okay, uh, with these um, undulators, radiation coming out from a small spot into a small angle has decent coherence properties, which we'll talk about. And if you put a little aperture there, you can get basically full spatial coherence. So this looks like radiation from a helium neon laser or something like that with a little aperture where there are all these uh, nulls or dark rings and bright rings, okay? But we can do that at the ALS. This is from the ALS. It was part of Chris Rosefield's um, PhD thesis in electrical engineering and Yanwei Lu also. Okay. Uh, this is just the kind of power curves. I'll just tell you that at, with an ALS undulator just coming out, no pinhole, you typically radiate a watt of power at these kind of interesting photon energies. Uh, there's a fundamental and there are harmonics also, and we use the harmonics. In fact, Chris used harmonics for that uh, image I showed you a second ago. But if you put pinholes in front, uh, you can spatially, and you have a monochromator also, you can get um, half a milliwatt, yeah, half a milliwatt of radiation with really good coherence properties. So you basically have a laser. It's not as, it's bigger than your handheld laser pointer, but it's getting you into the 100 EV region at the ALS or to KEV uh, energies, photon energies, uh, at hard X-ray facilities like APS or Spring 8. Does someone want to ask or make a comment? I mean, to me, these things were startling when I first learned about them. So. Anyway, I think you'll find that this is a little bit of algebra involved, but you will find it goes quite well. So this is the idea then, this is an undulator like we've just been talking about, but, um, and this is the relativistically correct form of the, uh, uh, the Lorentz equation, uh, and where P is uh, the momentum, okay? But you, you're gonna see, it's gonna look really familiar to you when we do this. But anyway, if you make a really long undulator, for instance, the one at Slack is something like a kilometer long. It's not a thousand meters of magnets because there are spaces, but it is a kilometer, it's more than a kilometer long. And the last few classes we've gone there on a tour, um, and the tour was led by former students in this class. Uh, but at any rate, um, it, the radiation in a long enough undulator starts with all the electrons uncorrelated, just moving around randomly, sort of colliding with each other, but because of the relativistic effect, the effective mass is gigantic. So even though they collide, you don't knock out too many. But anyway, it starts with radiation, um, which is kind of somewhat random. It looks like the undulator radiation we just talked about, and the, the, uh, the electron density might look like this, some random thing. But as you go along through the undulator, uh, there's a feedback mechanism and the, radi the electrons start to bunch into a wave and the further they go, they can get to a fully modulated beam. So the 10 to the ninth electrons would typically be in several hundred cycles, okay? And it would look like this then. So these are these waves. And now all of these electrons radiate in phase with each other. Their electric fields add up. Here, the electric fields didn't add up when you averaged over let's say a few cycles or a second because of the motion of the particles there wasn't a consistent adding of electric fields so each one the power calculation was just what's the radiate power calculated from one of them and just multiply by how many there are now you go over here the electric fields are adding so here the power radiated by all of the electrons a capital n a number like 10 to the eighth or 10 to the ninth, the power radiated was 10 to the eighth times one of them. It's n times. But over here, because the electric fields are adding, and we're gonna learn a little electromagnetics, that uh, intensity goes as electric fields squared. And when the, when the 
So when the electric fields add in phase, the electric field will be n times bigger, and the intensity or the power radiated will be n squared bigger. So that's where this might be a watt or a few watts, and this is going to be gigawatts. Okay, that 10 to the extra 10 to the eighth or ninth is because here the electric fields are adding in phase, and here they were not. So some of these are new concepts for you, but you'll get, as you get into it, I think they'll make sense. Um, professor? Uh, sir? Yeah, please. Um, on the previous slide, or maybe this is the slide before, you're showing the energy at the ALS, and you mentioned that was like without a pinhole. So is the function of the pinhole to like focus energies at specific, or like focus like power at specific energy levels? No, thanks for the question. No, the pinhole is a filter. So there was a lot of power here, but it was spread over different angles, okay, and over a different size. But when you put the pinhole, there was a pinhole and there was also an angular aperture down, you wind up selecting only some of the particles within a certain diameter and within a certain angle. And that product of psi, diameter of the source, the radiating source and the angle, that product, when that's about lambda over two, everything's coherent. And so, but you put a pinhole there, so you, you're removing a lot, you're only allowing some electrons to come through. And so you knock the power down for that. And then you might knock it down also because it's spectrally broad and you want it to be narrower. So undulator radiation is usually something like 1% bandwidth, one over N where N is the number of magnet periods. But for spectroscopy, if you're probing atoms, you typically want resolutions of 1.10 to the fourth or even better. So you may put a monochromator on it and you pay a price again. So this one, this was a roughly a watt of power, everything coming out. This one put a pinhole in front of it and it had 89 cycles of the magnet. So lambda over delta lambda was this, but now this is spatially coherent. So you lost some factor here of 30, something like that. And then if you put a monochromator in to get a higher spectral resolving power, you lose again. When you get to the free electron laser, you don't lose any of those things. Okay, the, the, uh, okay so we'll talk about that. And in fact, in a laser, just your typical visible light laser, the pinhole and the spectroscopy are all built into the cavity. And that's why I'd like to present at least one, one uh, one lecture to you when we get to that area so that you understand what is it, what is, how do these things relate to lasers, you know? And so you'll see that with uh, a helium neon laser that has good coherence properties or something like that, there is a pinhole, but it's inside the laser rather than outside after it's been generated. So thank you. This is a great question. Is there a question on the previous slide? Um, yeah. This one? No, the one before that. Yeah, what are the axes, uh, the values for the uh, the axes on the unmodulated and, and the, the three graphs that show the modulation? This one, it says Z. So this is a direction Z. This is the propagation direction. Okay, so they're going along Z, but this is out, out of scale. These are a few centimeters from north to north. This, these are, these, uh, this wave here, I guess I don't have it on this particular, this is a wave, one wavelength from here to here. So like one X-ray or one EUV wavelength from peak to peak. So this is only so many microns long. It might have several hundred cycles, let's say 300 cycles, and they're each uh, an X-ray wavelength long, an angstrom. So 300 angstroms. So this is not to scale. So I'm more careful in the book to say not to scale. But thank you. That was great, Andrew. Okay, and so there's some exponential growth, and we'll actually derive in class what what is the what is the the growth length of this thing? We wind up that it's a little bit of work. For those who are interested in it, it'll seem, oh how wonderful. And for those who are not interested, well, other things in the class will interest you, but good to know what's going on. Oh yeah, so we'll, we'll calculate what the gain length is, okay? And by the way, so we keep looking every, listening every year for the Nobel announcements to see if the free electron, X-ray free electron laser is gonna get a prize, but we have been disappointed. And the, we, I know personally, 
the Nobel Committee of Physics Committee has had for several interests a really strong interest in that, but um, never quite gets there. Black holes keep winning. So I don't want to talk about this now, but this has to do with when you see uncorrelated emitters and when you and when you see correlated emitters. So this is a Young's double slit experiment for those of you who recognize it. And if not, you will uh, when we get there. So this will be one of the topics that gets explained a bit in the fourth uh, chapter, but comes up in the, um, in the high harmonic and the FEL sources. Okay, does anyone, if anyone who just wants to jump in at a certain point, just jump in. Well, this is the high harmonic diagram I showed you before, right? Very short pulses come in, get focused on some gas, uh, maybe a gas jet, produces harmonics, that's the purple, the red is still coming, then there's a filter that blocks the red. This is 800 nanometers, so it's infrared. Sometimes they double it first and do it. And then out comes the radiation, and we'll see in a moment, it comes out in, har in harmonics of this frequency, okay? So this is, these are historical from people who were looking at what comes out. And um, in, the, in the early 90s, okay, um, uh, the first, one of the very first observation was by a PhD thesis in France by Anne Lullier. So she's French, she's uh, in uh, Lund, Sweden now where she's a professor. Uh, but this is, this is what they saw, and the radiation was coming out, had these harm harmonic pulses, um, uh, spikes, okay? So we'll go through and we'll calculate relatively simply what kind of, how, how high of radiation you should get out of these harmonics, out of this radiation, and why it comes out in harmonics. And so these are some, uh, these three are sort of early, early publications. Uh, and here's a more recent one where you're just getting beautiful spectra. And this one, which is which? Oh uh, yeah, this is by Pfeiffer in Germany. Yeah. At some other point, we'll have one that was done here at LBL. Uh, uh, an AST student did his, his uh, thesis and we'll have a publication on that. A professor? So, yeah. On the previous slide, is there a difference between harmonic number and harmonic order, or are those the same thing? I think it's the same thing. Okay. And people use different letters. So I started, I've start, I've, different people use different uh, abbreviations. So I've started using H as the harmonic number, okay? But you'll see other, and, and people will say order, and, and, and they're both accurate. And it maybe I might be, anyway, thanks for the question. So <laughs> this is the so-called three-step model. There's the tunnel, of, uh, so the, 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 ad, the atoms are all there, they all have electrons and they're nearby, and in comes a very intense laser field. The, the electric field is, is comparable, but not as strong as the electric field of a, associated with a Bohr atom, with a model of a Bohr atom with a single hydrogen electron. Uh, it, you, with that, you get an electric field uh, between the, the single electron and the nucleus, and there's an electric field that goes with that. And this incident electric field that's coming from the Thai sapphire laser is comparable with that Bohr electric field for the n equals one orbit around the, uh, the nucleus. So it's very strong, but it's not so strong that it just rips the thing off. It requires some tunneling. So there's a tunneling of the electron through the atom's potential binding energy, really, um, in this intense laser field. Once it's pulled out, it tunnels out, then it's, it's, in, it's in the neighborhood of the ion, the parent ion, but the electric field from the laser is quite strong, and it's, the electron is accelerated away from the atom, so it's pulled off first, liberated, that's the, uh, that's the tunneling, and then it's accelerated away, far away, and when the laser field turns around, it comes back, and it can collide 
with the original ion. There's a probability there of whether it hits it or misses it. But at any rate, if it does, it has gained a lot. It, it can, depending on uh, one of the parameters, it can have gained a lot of energy in that laser field, that intense laser field. Plus, it had the binding energy. So when it comes in, it's quite a crash. And there's a lot of energy involved. And it comes out as photons. Okay? So there's an acceleration and a deceleration of the electron in the intense laser field as it returns to the parent ion up upon the laser field reversal. So the, the strong laser field pulls the electron out of the atom, accelerates it away, brings it back in again, and there's a potential collision or a recombination and outcome photons, okay? So emission of photons having energy equal to the binding energy, what was required to pull it away, now it's going to regain that, plus the kinetic energy that it gained in the laser field. So that's called a three-step model. Uh, this is a little bit of a diagram of it. Here's this infrared 800 nanometer Thai sapphire, should be a few cycles. And here's an atom, some um, closed shell, well, neon it says, okay, closed shell, because uh, we don't want electrons coming off too easily. And then an electron the electric field here pulls the one of the electrons off. It gets accelerated away. The field of the electric, the electric field of the laser reverses, and this thing comes back and doesn't always hit. In fact, that's one of the issues. But uh, often enough, it comes back, collides. It's gained kinetic energy, plus it has the binding energy. And these are some of the formulas that we're going to wind up using. Okay. Um, okay, so, so probably a lot of the chemistry students in the class know a lot about this, but it'd be interesting for the rest of you to know about it also. And do we talk yes, sir? Yeah. I have yeah. a question on slide 50. Um, when the electron comes back to, yeah. like the figure, it seems like, the, like on the electron left, it like there was like, an empty spot right there and then like yeah. electron came back so is it because like i guess the time scale that it takes for electron to like get out and then come back is a lot faster than the time scale it takes for like another core level electron to drop down to that shell uh you no know, good question but we're the carefully chosen uh inert atoms so this is a closed shell and it's not pulling out one of the inner shell electrons but it's pulling out uh, an electron from the outer shell. So there's no, there's no dropping back. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't know offhand. But anyway, there is no electron. There are no electrons in, a, in another shell. So here it's neon in n equals 1 and n equals 2 shells. There's no n3 for the, for the neon. And so they always use these, iner these inert uh, atoms. So helium, neon, argon, krypton. Okay, thank you. So, so, so it stays that way long enough for this thing to come back. Do you know what the time scale is for that thing to come back? I do, um, but what do I, well, for instance, here's the cycle. One cycle of the electric field is a few femtoseconds. It's less than that, right? It's, it's the time for an electron to be pulled off, which is near the maximum, but not at the maximum of the electric field to go away and come back again. So it's a fraction of this. So it's a, a order of femtosecond. And this is where, by the way, this is a great place. There are, I think, four chemistry students here who are also looking at these things. So if I say something that's not quite correct, please jump in. Um, I was going to ask a question too about how this is physically tested because. Um, uh, like in the real world, how, how do they actually verify that this is how long it takes for the electron to leave and then come back? Uh, does someone from chemistry want to speak to that? It's, it's simple dynamics, uh, but, uh, and it's matched by observing, um, by changing the different parameters uh, you, you get to check all of these things. So I'll show you some graphs. Uh, I don't think now, but uh, when we get to it, we'll, we'll get more into those issues about what okay. controls that, okay? And whether or not what comes out here has enough 
energy to get into the 100, let's say 50 or 100 EV, but it winds up coming out as a lot of harmonics because there are many atoms and there's many cycles in the pulse here. Let me just see what comes next. Well, this is just some, this is one of the earliest experiments where this 80 attoseconds was seen, okay? Um, at, at around 80 EV. So this is, this is the, uh, the time axis and this is the photon energy. This is the way it's measured. This is uh, this group um, in Garking, the Max Planck Institute. And Andy Aquila, uh, he would give us a tour of the FVL at Stanford if he were there, but it was his PhD thesis. He was, he was going in other directions, multi-layer coatings for astrophysics and all kinds of other things. And then uh, he got involved in the high harmonic, mirrors for high harmonics. And that became, his last year was his PhD thesis. Oh. Okay, so that's all I have on high harmonics now, but we'll spend a lot more time on it when we get there. Uh, the next chapter in the book is about plasmas. And here, uh, here are the, the main parameters of a plasma. Well, this is the, the, the plasma frequency is defined in this way where this is the electron density. And there's a so-called Debye length, a screening distance, which both play important parts, but the electron density and the electron temperature, if you don't know the two of these, I would say you don't know anything about that plasma. You essentially, you must know these two things, at least to some degree of knowledge, um, you gotta know them, okay? Other things you'd be interested in, if there's a magnetic field, what's the cyclotron frequency? Uh, if the plasma is expanding, uh, which could be an astrophysics thing or it could be an EUV lithography thing, What's the expansion velocity? Where does this formula come from? We will derive this formula, okay? And it's not quite as complicated as it looks. And there's a so-called critical electron density, uh, which has to do with wave propagation, okay? And there's some aspects of the kinetic theory come in here, and I find it very useful to use some black body formulas in the plasmas, okay? Uh, the graph here is just showing um, some kinds of plasmas where this is the electron temperature in EV, electron volts, and this is the electron density. And uh, these are different aspects. These are electrical discharges. You know, like a fluorescent light in your office is a plasma, okay? Uh, and these are related to that, these discharge plasmas. They're relatively low electron density. Here's a magnetic fusion plasma. Uh, high temperature, not so high density. If you know about the Lawson criteria, 10 to the 14th electrons per cc and one kilovolt or 10 kilovolts is an important parameter. And, uh, and so these are parts, these are related to the sun, different parts, depths of the sun. So you can see solar interior. But for instance, here is laser produced plasmas. They are really up there in electron density and temperature. So we'll get, we'll look at that. Do any of the plasma people want to comment? Some of the projects that I put on that list involve the expansion velocity. Okay. So the plasma, for instance, when a laser light, intense laser light is focused on a little target, a um, piece of uh, uh, a small microsphere of silicon, uh, SiO2, uh, the expansion velocity of the plasma, so there's an ablation process. The light comes in, focuses in on our little target, our little uh, sphere of glass, basically. It absorbs the light and um, it heats it. And when it heats it, some of the electrons get free and they, they move away from the thing. And they start moving away with some velocity. But there's a charge, they leave behind an excess of positive charge. And so uh, some of the, ion, it gets hot enough, the ions are also coming off. The electrons are light and they've got most of the energy and they'd like to go flying off. But charge, uh, the charge on the, uh, the ion sphere that they're leaving behind forces them to expand together. And the expansion velocity is driven by the electron temperature, which is driving it, but the mass of the ion that's got to come along, okay? 
And so you wind up with this as an expansion velocity. And this is not the same gamma, but this is not the relativistic gamma. This is a ratio of specific heats. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about that for now. We'll talk more and I need to hear from the plasma people on these issues. So here's what we would do uh, with some coverage of basic plasma physics. We go through the basic, we would observe that there are basic equations which could be either kinetic or fluid, but we can start at a microscopic level and the book does that because years ago when I was uh, starting to write the book, uh, I had a strong interest in going from the microscopic uh, uh, description where you're looking at every electron and ion in the plasma, uh, how you come up with a more, a kinetic distribution, a velocity distribution function, and then eventually a fluid equations, which would be quite familiar to the mechanical engineering people or the chemi e e people, but these would be uh, fluid properties of density, temperature, et cetera. So these are the important parameters, the electron density, temperature. There's also ion, ion density and ion temperature, but sometimes they're less important a cyclotron frequency if there's a magnetic field, and some expansion velocity. What we'll look at for sure, and I think we'll do this in a simple fashion, we're not gonna go through this. In fact, I would like the plasma people, they, they might wanna go through that, this, put some emphasis on this and go through themselves on the microscopic to kinetic to fluid. For us, we'll just observe that there, there are these properties and why you would be interested in having a kinetic theory, for instance. But basically, we're going to, we'll use the fluid equations and we'll calculate the expansion velocity. But for instance, for the high harmonic people, you would, you would really just like to know what is the refractive index of a plasma because it has some effect in the high harmonic process. The infrared light is, moves out of the focal spot. The focal spot expands because of refraction, plasma expa expansion, because there's so many free electrons there. And it acts like a negative, the plasma acts as a negative lens. So the high harmonic people just need a simple description of this. So we'll write Maxwell's equations, a very simple description of just the electrons, and we'll get the refractive index for the plasma. I think we can do it on a single slide. And so we'll, that'll be a goal. We'll do that as a, uh, in addition to whatever else or mixed into whatever we do here, we will do that separately. So ablation, plasma expansion, they're important things for astrophysics. Uh, we don't have anyone this year from astrophysics, but we have. Uh, but it's critical to EUV lithography. So if anyone's interested in following up, that could be done. And there's a lot of laser plasma interactions which involve high intensity lasers, nonlinearities, and this um, nonlinear parameter, the oscillating velocity in the electric field divided by the thermal. So if, the, if there's a, some, th some thermal velocity which goes with the temperature and the electron in the electric field of a incoming laser or a wave, if that oscillating velocity, which you just get from F equals ma, uh, if that's small compared to the thermal, you're not gonna have nonlinearities. If it's big, equal to one, greater than one. This is why laser fusion doesn't work for energy. I worked on it for a lot of years. I really hoped we were gonna make fusion with lasers because if we, it, in the end, it requires that this quantity be roughly one. You get into such strong nonlinearities that um, laser fusion is no, it's, is no longer a serious contender for fusion in in your lifetime, never mind mine. Okay, so this is uh, this is going to be about lasers, and uh, we'll see how much we want to talk about that at the time. Um, but I think it's worth me mentioning to you, so as a part of this class, you know what exists. But we could do that in one lecture. I might want to use a second lecture, or maybe I can squeeze it into one. But maybe a second lecture just to tell you. What is the lasing process? How, where, this, has, this could be in, in the visible or the infrared. How does the lasing process start? What is this about absorption, spontaneous emission, stimulated emission? Uh, I certainly don't wanna go through all, deriving all the equations, but for someone who wanted to do it as a report project, 
it's there in the book and we can get up to speed on whatever's going on. But there are, you'll see this in, in the book in that chapter. There are several slides which describe the starting of the laser process and how you get the coherence properties you want. For instance, this, this would be a diagram of, one of, of an early laser, but one that you could still buy with a laser rod and mirrors um, and uh, a pinhole inside the cavity. So the pinhole, rather than being outside and cutting down on the power, it's inside so that the only power that the only radiation that gets through and amplified has had to go through the pinhole. So it comes out with the perfect, uh, what we call TEM00 uh, spatially coherent mode. So I, I wanna take some time on that, but it depends on your interest. So I'll ask you again when we get there. Uh, this is about not the latest Nobel Prize, but the one before, uh, which involved uh, Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland, amongst others, uh, for their method of generating high intensity, ultra short optical pulses. So I knew them both when they were working on this at Rochester. Uh, Donna was a graduate student at the time, but uh, shortly after she, they won the Nobel Prize, uh, Donna, who has visited us here in Berkeley many times, came and she gave a presentation. Uh, if any of you heard it, it was a really great talk. And um, anyway, so Donna is a good, comes to Berkeley many times. And oh yeah, she told me this. She told me some stories about this, but uh, of, all the, of all the Nobel laureates, who does the king escort to dinner? Well, first of all, he picks a physicist first. And secondly, if there happens to be a woman, it's a woman physicist. So Donna Strickland was the first. Okay, and there's, I have a, ho a whole bunch of stories I'm going to tell when we get there uh, that relate to Donna. Uh, now, this has to do with x-ray imaging. How much are we out of time? Yeah. Professor? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Why don't we always put the pinhole inside the cavity if it helps with the intensity in that way? So, um, with the undulator radiation, we're generally not trying to get coherence. It's just a few people around the ring who want it. Most people just want that watt of power. They're not interested in a half a milliwatt. Okay, so, so, we wouldn't, so we just don't do it, okay? We do it for those people who want, you know, there are these 12 straight sections and a lot of bending magnets. So for those who want, they put the pinhole there um, to get the coherence they want, but they pay a price. You know, the pinhole is smaller than the electron beam, so. Okay, so great question. But for the free electron laser, we actually are interested in coherence. So the FEL produces coherent radiation. So it's not only gigawatts, it's coherent gigawatts. And there, there's no pinhole, but the accelerated physicists are so good at what they do that they can make the electron beam have a size that's equivalent to a pinhole. So I, we, we, we will talk about that. It'll be in the slides when we're talking about it. So they start with a, when the undulator radiation, the ALS, they presently have a relatively large elliptical, elliptical beam, large in one direction, not so large in the other direction. Not quite what we want, but close. Uh, you know, the ALS is gonna have an upgrade, perhaps, you know, and the upgrade is to take that elliptical beam and make it a little circle, a little, uh, make the cross section circular so that it's close to co it's close to the coherence criteria uh, that we want so it'll be equivalent to having a pinhole inside okay so this uh so now we're getting into imaging imaging and optics i mixed them together they're separate chapters but and this is not the first image you've, that was produced in rankin's laboratory you know the first one was frau rankin he, uh, is, is an image of her hand and it's kind of blurry. And I don't generally use that because people get the sense that in Rankin's time, X-ray imaging wasn't quite as precise as it is now, which is absolutely not true. It's just that that was the very first one he did. And if you've done experiments, the first experiment is not always the best one, but this was just a few weeks later, he gave his first public presentation. And before the presentation, he did uh, he made an x-ray image, basically a shadowgram, just the way we do it today, 
um, of the host for the, um, the uh, uh, what would you call it, not the symposium, the presentation he was, he was making, okay, in the physics department. So uh, it, it's really an interesting thing. If anyone wants to read, read the papers, here is a, a really high quality classical physicist. They were, there were many people around the world working to understand what is an electron. They did not understand in 1895 what was, what was an electron, how was it related to electrical currents, and what did it do, have to do with atoms. Uh, later that got, there were some Nobel Prizes, for instance, um, to, uh, to Thompson. Um, uh, so, so another, more than, around another 10 years before people understood. But there's a lot of people working on electrical discharges, like we talked about before for the plasma, where there's a gas inside a glass tube and there are electrons, because there's a voltage or electrons going through and they're producing some ionization in that. But the, at, when the electrons go from the cathode through the gas, and hit the anode, something special happens, which we call an X-ray, but that wasn't known at the time. And so Röntgen was in his lab and he noticed he was doing his research as many people around the world were doing it with these discharge tubes. And he noticed some fluorescence a few feet away. And where is that, how is that happening? What, you know, this was a puzzle. And he put different things in between his discharge and the fluorescent material, and he could block it. And so, he, so there was something going on there. And he spent a few weeks just doing experiments by himself, doors closed, technician not allowed in the room, wife just coming to bring food and get her an x-ray of her hand. And... Uh, he goes through this very methodical study of what he was seeing and what it depended on. And uh, so he got the first Nobel Prize in physics. Okay? And he made his presentations. So in January of 1896, so the first discovery, his first observation was November 8th. And what is this? You know, it's like less than three months later, he makes a public presentation. And this goes out around the world. Uh, and it appears in newspapers that someone in Germany has seen the inside of a hand. But these discharge tubes are everywhere. So in the United States, there were more than 10 labs, I don't know how many, who were doing research just like that. So they just reproduced it. So within weeks of this public announcement, all over the world, there were images of hands and broken bones and all kinds of things. It was just wildfire. So we'll talk about the optics that are available. Okay, we'll talk about the fact that X-rays at normal incidence or an arbitrary angle to some material, almost any material, get absorbed and they reflect very, very little. Um, um, and I mean really little. Okay, uh, but if you come in at glancing incidence, you can get a good reflection. So we'll we'll talk about that. I mentioned it in the, one of the earlier lectures, but we'll go through some algebra on that. And we'll find out what is this critical angle, which if you come in shallow enough, you'll get a good reflection. You can be <coughs> 80 or 90 percent, depends. We'll also talk about interference coatings, often called just multi-layers or multi-layer mirrors, but they're interference coatings of two different materials with a nice despacing. So it's a little bit like uh, a crystal, but it's amorphous in the planes. Okay, And one of the layers shown is white here is usually non-absorbing and they used to call it the spacer, okay? Now that's not how we understand it so much. But at every interface, there's a little weak reflection. And, uh, and so this is not critical, this is not within the critical angle. This could be normal incidence. It works extremely well in the EUV. In fact, it is, uh, it is the enabling technology for EUV lithography without Without these multi-layer coatings, we'll see one in a moment of molysilicon with these uh, multiple reflections adding up in phase. So again, the electric fields add up and you'll see um, you can get around 70%, you can get up to 70% reflectivity even at normal incidence, but at relatively longer wavelengths, not real X-ray wavelengths, but in the extreme ultraviolet, so wavelengths of 
for instance, around 10 or 20 nanometers or 40 nanometers, okay? So we'll talk about this, how you, you know, how you, how you make them and how you use them and what's, how does this interference work? And by the way, you, when you analyze this, we'll see, you get the Bragg equation, okay, for this structure. So we'll also talk about diffraction. <coughs> so one is gratings either in reflection or transmission. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about zone plates, which are, they're like circular gratings. They're just like this, but they're circular. And the inner zones are kind of large and the outer ones get smaller. And we'll, we'll use the Pythagorean formula to find out what are the radii of these things. And these are made. They're usually smaller than a human hair in diameter for X-ray wavelengths, okay? but there's a selective interference here and you can get these things can provide a real first order focus, uh, a real focus, okay? And we use them at the ALS. These are used for scanning x-ray microscopes or imaging x-ray microscopes, the like. Uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna cover a lot of crystal optics, but we will at least mention them because we use them in the synchrotrons Okay, so we use a double crystal monochromator as a way to, um, to get a, a narrow spectral band, okay? And in general, uh, X-rays are absorbed in materials, but if you get to high enough energies, particularly around 10 keV or a little bit higher, even better, remember the refractive index is a little unusual. It's one minus delta rather than one plus. So rather than have a, uh, a convex focusing lens, you have a concave focusing lens. So it looks odd, but that's what happens. And if you put a whole series of them back to back, it could look like this, a bunch of ellip ellipsoids, one after the other. And if you look at this region right here, it looks like this. It's fatter here than it is here. And with a whole bunch of these, you can make a lens out of this. So we'll go through that again also. So these will be the mace the main things, except uh, this diagram doesn't show a pinhole, but certainly a pinhole is one of the optics we use. Okay, we'll talk about things like Gaussian focus, depth of focus, resolution. We're going to talk about all of these things, okay? And I'll give you lots of measures because depending on the group or the department you're in, you may use one over square root of E, or you may use full width at half max. Laser people like full width at half max, accelerated people like RMS, other people use one over E squared. So we'll just put them all in place, but we will look at uh, where these equations come from and what they are. What is depth of focus and what is depth of field and stuff like that. And we'll talk about resolution. Suppose you're looking at one, one bright star, it just looks like a point source. And in your optic, it's gonna have a certain width, it depends on your optic, not on the radiation from the star. The star is essentially a point source, but what if you have two stars and you, or you have two pinholes, with the same star, and you bring them close together. At a certain point, they're overlapping and there's a dip. And that's called a Rayleigh dip and the Rayleigh dip is when the maximum of one overlaps the minimum of the other. So the maximum here is overlapping the minimum. So these are brought together and we're adding intensities here, I should have said. And um, the separation, Rayleigh said, this is a good measure of resolution. I can just have this little dip if I just put these two things close enough, you know, that the, the max and the mins overlap each other. And that gives you an example of resolution. It's not the only measure you could use, but it's the most common one that we use. And the Rayleigh resolution, for instance, for a microscope or some optical system is roughly a half lambda over the numerical aperture, okay? And if you have a periodic structure because you had a grading and you were using it as a resolution test, you'll see something like this. So we'll talk about um, depth of focus and resolutions and stuff like that. Uh, this is just more of the same. This is just showing Rayleigh resolution with two point sources and a lens, and they're each producing, if it's coherent, they're each producing an airy pattern. Okay. Uh, we will talk about, this is the so-called Kirkpatrick-Baez mirror pair. So there's two glancing incidence reflections, 
at that angle that we talked about for where even hard x-rays will reflect if you come in at a small enough angle. And so one is curved in one direction, which provides focusing in that direction, and its partner is curved in the other direction, so it provides focusing in that direction. If you wanted the ideal system for point to point, whoops, for point to point imaging, so the corner of the B to the corner of the B and just going through every point here and imaging it over here, you'd want these things to be elliptical because the ellipses provide point to point, okay? And there'd be some magnification if, if they're closer to the source and everything. So it's usual, it's a usual optical system of um, the, uh, one over P plus one over Q equals one over the focal length, something like that. But anyway, this is the most common X-ray optic used. They're used on so many beam lines and free electron laser beam lines, etc. And so we'll under, when we calculate the critical angle, we'll see how these things work. And it's called Kirkpatrick bias after Paul Kirkpatrick, who was a professor at Stanford, and Al Bayes was his name, Albert Bayes. Uh, I knew both of them quite well, and. Uh, uh, what we call now Baez, uh, he was a professor, I think at University of the Redlands in Northern California, but he wanted to get his PhD. So he came to Stanford and worked for his friend, Paul Kirkpatrick. And one time at a conference, um, Al couldn't be there, but Paul was able to come. He was 90 at the time. I'll tell you some more stories about it, but uh, he was asked by someone in the audience at the end of his presentation, who was his best student? Because he had a lot of famous students. And Paul, being 90 years old, uh, just uh, blew everybody away by saying, oh, that's easy. Um, it was Joni. I taught Joni to play the guitar. <laughs> so Joni was Joan Baez, the folk song singer in the Vietnam period. So there's some, some great stories about the two of them. And these, these are, there are other, this is not KB optics. Um, these are other kinds of optics, um, uh, Schwarzschild optics. Uh, and they're double, anyway, these are used in, in astronomy and they use it in nested groups. So they, they collect a lot of uh, radiation. And this is a composite of both X-ray imaging and visible light and, and UV light on the so-called Chandra X-ray observatory. And, so we'll, actually this year we may not talk about this except to show a picture or two because there's nobody here from physics or astrophysics. Uh, and here's a, another, this is an image of the sun. Here's the solar limb. Because of the magnetic fields, there are, radiation is going out in loops. This is seen, uh, the wavelength, the photon energy here is an emission line of iron. There's a lot of iron. Iron is the highest Z, Z equals 26 of common elements in the universe. And these are, you are looking at emission here from, um, from uh, iron, ions, okay? And uh, the earth would be a, a, little, a little circle here in comparative size. And this image, oh, this is from Leon Golub at Harvard Smithsonian and Troy Barbie, who was the inventor uh, or the, yeah, I guess you call him inventor of the molysilicon multilayer. Um, but, um, this is an image, I had, I had a poster of this out at the ALS and um, Neil, what was his last name? He was, the, he was the head of the, he was the NSF director at the time, came through for a tour and um, he saw it and he said, oh, Al Gore would just love that because Al Gore was the vice president and he was a science oriented person. And so uh, Neil, whatever his last name was, took the poster off so that he could put it in the White House with the vice president. Uh, here is a picture of a zone plate. I told you the inner zones are kind of wide. The outer zones get finer and finer. This is from our co-author, Ann Sakdinawat of the book. And she's at Slack now, and she has a group there called Nano X. And they make these things uh, and lots of other things. And so we'll talk about zone plates. I told you if you use the Pythagorean formula, you would get the formula for 
what the what the what the radii should be ever you know getting bigger and bigger but closer and closer this is the formula but all it is is pythagorean formula and we'll understand how these zone plates work what is their depth of focus uh, this is an image this is from a ct scan for those who are interested so this is a biological cell i think it's a mouse cell as i remember and uh, this is the double membrane this is the nuclear membrane here the double is the first time we ever saw with x-rays the double uh, um, double layer membrane nuclear membrane that we knew about from electron microscopy but we had never seen it and there's all kinds of structures here uh, endoplasmic reticulum lysosomes uh, etc uh, but this is one slice from a three-dimensional uh, CT scan so basically they have the sample and they rotate the sample slowly while they take different x-ray images over and over uh, something like does it say here but it'd be, it'd be something like every third of a degree or this is on this one it's every one degree okay the zone plate has a outer zone of 25 nanometers so that's approximately the resolution and this is the photon energy it's in the so-called water window where water doesn't absorb very much because the cell has a lot of water and we don't want to dry it okay and for material science people the same micros microscope here it's being used for uh, for titanium nitrite uh, nano ribbons and looking at their spectrum and various features that they can find is even a polarization effect actually at this nano scale. This is an interesting one. This is a fluorescent imaging. So this is from Marina Cote, it says at the bottom. And Marina's interest is in um what does the phrase um i can't see if it's on the cap <laughs> if it's in the title because i have something blocking the title but um basically human culture uh, cultural what um old old things so archaeology but she has a good phrase for it and anyway, she studies different things. Uh, in this case, she's looking at an Egyptian vase. They allowed her to have a little tiny speck of the blue. They're trying to find out why does that blue hold up so well? There are other blues. This is the Egyptian blue, but there are others. There's a, a Thai blue and there's a, oh, if you go to the, um, um, to Istanbul and some of the, the, um, the great, um, oh, what do you call them? Not churches, but um, you'll find also they have blues. And, and so uh, she, she was trying to analyze what, how did they make this and everything. And it wound up that they matched the spectrum uh, on a microscopic scale and for this very old Egyptian vase. And they were able to figure out what, what it was in the blue that gave it the blue. And that basically it had to be nanostructures of this size. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. In fact, I didn't put this on the list, but last year some people, I think both from chemistry, two of them, at any rate did a project. And um, the, I wonder if I even have it. The latest issue of The Economist magazine, it's like a, high quality news magazine comes out every week but it has numbers it's quantitative it's not like newsweek or that but they have an article maybe i could show you does that show up yeah so it turns out that people are now scientists are using x-ray techniques other techniques also uh, infrared techniques and visible laser techniques, but they're using x-rays to go around and authenticate artwork. And they're finding all kinds of surprises, things that they thought uh, were originals, were, were not by the, the people they thought it was, or they found underlying um, earlier paintings by the same famous person. And there's all kinds of interesting things going on. And so the big, um, um, the art places that uh, that do auctions are now using these x-ray techniques which started out at the synchrotron in grenoble france called psrf 
that's where they started and that's where Regina uh, Marina does her work but now they've gotten it down to they can use a, uh, a classical x-ray tube and do this and go to different places and so the the art auctioneers are trying to authenticate and validate the art that they've got. So that's another area someone might find really interesting to do a project on. Dave, I think you called them cultural heritage imaging. Oh, so wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Leona. Yeah, cultural heritage. It's, it's Marina's word, and um, she's got a gigantic following now. So we'll talk about x-ray tomography. Uh, I think Ann Sakdinawat, who was the one who put this in the book, is going to come and talk. But for the people who do projects that involve CT scans and that, this will be interesting to go through. Uh, this is uh, some of that tomography. This was done at the ALS a few years ago. It was done by Gerd Schneider at the time. But there's an x-ray microscope. This is the microscope here. There's the object. This is the lens which is up close this is not to scale so this would be like a magnification of a thousand so this is up close and readout is on a ccd and the object is rotated so in this case there's biological structures in this uh, transparent tube and it's rotating and they're taking an image for instance every third of a degree or every degree this is the als a, bend, a bending magnet, a mirror, and a, a condensing lens to illuminate the sample. But this is the microscope here, okay? And this is an image, this is an image of a yeast cell from Carolyn Larabelle, who works at the ALS, and Mark Legros. And, uh, and this thing, I wonder what's gonna happen when I click. Is it gonna rotate? Well, I forgot to mount the movie, but this thing rotates. And you can see the, the rotation of the sample, and you can see through it, and you can see all the structures, which may be in the next thing. No, they're not. Anyway, this would be nanometer scale, maybe tens of nanometers, 20 nanometer scale. Uh, so for people who, who look at, um, at tomography, this might be one of the subjects with newer material. There's a whole bunch of other material available now. And this, this is an X-ray CT rotating sample, a double, this is in the Swiss light source uh, using a super bend, a very strong bending magnet, and a double crystal monochromator. No optics, just shadow casting through the object onto an X-ray scintillator. And that X-rays produ in, in produce light out, but there's a pattern here which rep represents the absorption in this sample. And that pattern is replicated by fluorescent visible light coming out. There's an ordinary lens, high NA visible microscope lens, which images that onto a visible CCD. And this is an example of, um, uh, as it says here, an embryo, a fossilized embryo, roughly 500 million years old, found in southern uh, China. They want to analyze inside of this because this was a period um, of uh, enormous uh, evolution of life forms was coming in this period in this period and they wanted to look inside um, this uh, this embryo but if you try to slice it with a, a sharp tool as in biology for slicing sample materials they just crumble you just wind up with dust so they put it in front of this x-ray beam and uh, they got some really good science out of it and uh, for the authors they got the front cover of nature so, and there's coherent diffractive imaging, which does, doesn't use a lens, but uses coherent light and diffraction. It's called CDI. And we'll talk about that a bit. Someone could do a project if they want. We'll talk about it a little bit. And this is an example of CDI. This I believe was done using the free electron laser at Stanford in which they're, they're using this coherent illumination of these biological cells this is the name of the cell, nominally a micron diameter in size, 1,000 nanometer. And they're coming by one out of the other, and they're recording a diffraction pattern and doing a reconstruction. And they're trying to get to molecular scale imaging using coherent light. And um, it's a long, hard road. That's what they're doing. 
uh oh we're out of time i'm sorry i didn't realize so um but we're just about there so this is tychography um we'll talk some these kinds of um coherent imaging techniques we'll talk about uh, when we get there and this has gotten down below 10 nanometers i think this technique at the als holds the record for the highest resolution imaging um, but the applications have been quite limited and we'll talk a little bit about euv lithography so next time we come I'll start on this slide. I'll mention a little bit about EUV lithography, and then we'll get into chapter two. So any questions or comments before we break? If you have some thoughts on any of the, on a project that you'd like to do, um, please let me know. Leona, did you want to say anything? Um on no okay well you on put out an email you put out an email asking people to let oh, me know oh i did yeah um let me I'll, i will send out another email about what the results are but for people who haven't filled out the the when to meet please fill it out so that we can figure out what a good weekly time for an office hour would be you can also just send me messages if you have questions but i thought maybe a, a an office hour with a few people would be more useful. Yeah. Okay, for the four people who are involved in Bella or interested in plasmas of different kinds, why don't you have a look at the chapter, the plasma physics chapter, just scan through it and send me some messages about what your thoughts are. And at the very end of that plasma chapter, there's a little bit about the droplets that are used in this EUV lithography. And that's kind of related to one of the projects. But anyway, have a look at the general chapter. Don't get in it too deep. Just have a look and send me some comments about what things interest you. Okay, I guess we're done. I'll see you Thursday.